and welcome back to another episode of RN Cliff Notes. And today we're going to be talking about the cranial nerves, but this is the second part, right? So we already did one through six. This time we're doing seven through 12. So let's jump right in. All right, I'm Cliff Davis, and Associate Dean of Nursing and longtime advanced medical surgical professor, okay? All right. So last video, if you remember, we talked about the cranial nerves. I like to throw questions in there and make sure you're learning some of these other concepts. So we asked about the total number of cranial nerves. This time we added in the spinal nerves because there's something we want to add as sort of an added bonus since you're watching the video, okay? All right, so total number of spinal nerves, what is it? Or write it down, preferably write it down. What is it? It is 62. So for those of you that knew the number 31, yes, there are 31 pairs, but that's pairs. The total number of spinal nerves is 62. Now, okay, so here's what I want you to do with me. I want you to say, count to three, and we'll repeatedly count to three together. It's important that you do this with me. Okay, so one, two, three, right? Again, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. What did we just do? What did we just learn? This is what we just learned. That, right? What? One, two, three, one, one, two. What are there? There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Three, one, what? 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So if you just remember to count to three, right, and cycle that over, you've got the total pairs of cranial nerves and spinal nerves. All right, congratulations. <laughs> okay. All right, now, what I wanted to do is revisit this concept right here, the 12 cranial nerves, that they're, what, 12 on both sides? That's what makes the pairs. Okay, good. And... You know how it is, watching my videos, right? <laughs> so you, you got your paper ready, or you got your, your pad ready, or your, your phone, or whatever, set for memo, and go. What are the cranial nerves? I need you to list them 7 through 12. Okay, if you need to pause the video, that's fine. 7 through, 7 through 12, go for it. Right? All right. What are they? Right? And don't forget, we want to, as we're talking about what those uh, cranial nerves are, we want to look at assessment techniques too. Okay? So, seven. Seven, this is where you're, you're having your patient make facial expressions, right? Check out those sevens. Now, what are they doing? You've got the number seven outlined in the face. This top part of the seven would be where a person's eyebrows are, right? And then the rest of the seven, right, coming down, what, their cheeks. So it says here, puffing out cheeks, smile, and frown. These kinds of expressions, what, help to illustrate seven. You can actually take your fingers, too, and you can make them into sevens. And they fit right in here. It's a good way to learn, right? So raise the eyebrows, puffing out the cheeks, these kinds of things. Seven, cranial nerve seven controls those things, okay? Eight. Eight. This is where you do the whisper test, right? Weber and Rene test and the Romberg test. So notice that the eight looks like a pair of earrings on both sides, right? Yes, we're going to be learning a little bit more about that. Nine. Nine is the gag reflex. This is the one you see time and time again on examinations because the gag reflex is critical in terms of med medical surgical care. If you've got a patient coming back who's had a bronchoscopy or some type of upper endoscopy where they've sprayed cetacane spray into the patient's mouth, right, and throat, and what happens? They've got that numbness going on and it'd be a bad idea to have them drink anything while they don't have the protection of their gag reflex. So, <clears throat> how do we check that out, by the way? With a gag reflex, the appropriate way to do it 
right? As most people think it's like, oh, put a put a tongue depressor in their mouth and then make them gag. No, okay, <laughs> that's not it. Tongue depressor, what? Just to move their tongue out of the way. And then we take a CT. What's a CT for those that don't know? A cotton tip swab. And then we stimulate the back of their throat with that CT, that cotton tip swab, right? So that's going to be like more comfortable. We don't want to take a wooden depressor and do that, okay? All right, now, 10. 10 is vagus, the vagus nerve. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about when it comes to that, all right? All right, we'll get into that in just a minute. At 11, notice that the location of 11 is these two lines right here on both sides. And how do we assess it? Shrugging the shoulders, right? And we like to do that sometimes with a little bit resistance from our hands and have our patients shrug their shoulders. That's 11. Then the last one, the hypoglossal, we're gonna have them demonstrate tongue movement. And some of our patients might not be able to do that because they've had a stroke or something like that. So they might have limitations when it comes to their tongue movement. So anyway, so we had seven, what? Facial, eight, acoustic, nine, glossal pharyngeal, 10 is vagus, and 11 is spinal accessory. Some, be, be careful, because sometimes they'll just say accessory, and they won't add the part, ex, the uh, spinal on it. So, accessory, and then hypoglossal. Okay, let's make a note here, okay? I want to point out to you the part that tends to trip students up. And it's this hypoglossal and glossal pharyngeal, right? Like a lot of glossal going on, <laughs> okay? But here's what you need to remember. What? In the alphabet, G comes before H. So 9 would be the glossal pharyngeal, and 12 would be the hypoglossal. G before H. But now, let's get into our study smart strategies, shall we? Okay, so first off, there's seven. Okay, now, bear with me. So seven, remember, outlines a person's face. So we've got what, the eyebrows, the cheeks. And if we look at our gentleman here that we've got a picture of, this is outlining his eyebrows and cheeks. And he happens to be suffering from Bell's palsy. This is where we can learn about the cranial nerves if we apply a disease process or a condition that helps enhance our memory. In this case, bells, the word bell, is spelled with what? Two L's. And those two L's for us, who are learning from R and Cliff Notes, we are gonna take those L's and do what? We're gonna take those L's and turn them into our magic number seven and turn them upside down, right? and help to remind us that these two sevens are the two sevens that fit on a person's face or the facial nerve. Yes? Good. All right, on to eight. <laughs> and we got this cute guy with the ears, right? Yeah, <laughs> head dog. So, right? So we said eight represents the ear. So, yes. If you think about earrings on this face, this face is great to learn the cranial nerves. But yes, vestibulocochlear. Vestibulocochlear. Now, you might have heard of your patient potentially having a cochlear implant. Now, your cochlea, your cochlea is, a, is an organ deep inside of your, your, your central nervous system and, and your hearing apparatus. And it looks like a seashell, right? kind of spirals in, your cochlea, yeah, vestibulocochlea. Nine, okay, so our study smart strategy for nine. Okay, notice where nine is, right there at the person's mouth, and we knew that nine was associated with the gag reflex, but, right, remember that we're going to take a tongue depressor and move the client's tongue out of the way, right? And as we're doing that, inserting that depressor, what I want you to think of in your mind is this number nine being the patient's head and what? Tongue depressor here. And the tongue depressor with the patient's head together, what? 
make the number nine if we turn it sideways. Yes, glossopharyngeal. Another way to look at that is the patient's head and they're sticking their tongue out and saying, ah, right, as their tongue's coming out, ah. So nine, glossopharyngeal. Excellent, moving on. Okay, now, <laughs> the, the vagus nerve, oh boy. Whew. All right, so we gotta be careful here. This is something we wanna talk about, but we do want to be careful. I'm gonna be talking about something that you should not go try. <laughs> oh boy, here we go, right? <laughs> so, so the uh, vagus nerve. Uh, all right, so let me take you back. Okay, so here uh, I was a kid and I learned about something that they call the pass out game. Now, heads up, you got any kids in the room, get them out of there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyway, so a uh, kid came to school and he's going, Hey, have you guys heard about the pass out game? Like, pass out game? What in the heck are you talking about? There's no such thing, right? So, anyway, uh, he demonstrates. So, it has one of the students up against the wall, and, and we're in the school, and, and not being properly supervised as kids, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like seventh grade or something. So, anyway, so the kid's up against the wall and takes 10 deep breaths in and out, in and out on the 10th breath and hold their breath. Right. Then he pushes into that kid's chest for like 10 seconds. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, right? At the end of the 10 seconds, let's go of the kid's chest. And man, right? People flop over to the floor. It is, ooh, it, it, you know, it sounds cool, but it is not cool. Uh, let's see. So we see where that 10 is, what? It's coming down from the mouth, and it's up in this area, right? And we're going to see a better picture of it here in a minute. So anywhere up in this area being stimulated in your GI tract. By the way, uh, an excellent example of that is when you're in the healthcare setting, hospital, long-term care, and you find your patient, they've passed out and they've fallen to the floor on the side of the commode. What happened? They were bearing down. And what was that bearing down simulating? The very same thing that we were just talking about with that kid, right? If the, your patient bears down too hard, they could potentially experience what? A vagal reaction. So you've heard of people vagaling down. Or the patient, what, vasovagal and passed out to the floor. That's what happened. This area where cranial nerve 10 is got overstimulated and your patient passed out. Now, in addition to that, that issue with the commode that we talked about, there are some patients that are experiencing so so much pain, their pain is so intense that they kind of can't help but hold their breath and they're trying to deal with the pain and they wind up vagaling down as well. So very important to address your patient's pain early and not have it get to this point in your patient having a vagal response. All right, stimulation of the vagus nerve, 10. Okay, here's a better picture I was telling you about. So the vagus nerve, and this is according to healthline.com, and we've got sensory functions. So it supplies visceral sensation, inf information for the lungs, heart, and digestive tract, that digestive tract. Lungs, heart, and digestive tract. So we're looking at this yellow line that's traveling down the patient's throat, through their thoracic cavity in their chest, down into their stomach in their digestive tract. And that's what we were talking about up in here that's getting overstimulated, right? Motor functions. Stimulation of muscles in the heart where it helps to lower resting heart rate and stimulating the digestive tract. Well, so let's back up for just a minute here because there's something I want to add when it comes to this lowering the resting heart rate. Okay, I got too many stories. <laughs> anyway, I worked in an emergency room, and I worked with a doctor that as soon as a patient came in with chest pain, you know, or, or angina, right, 
patient came in, chest pain, we're wondering if they're having a heart attack. Uh, my favorite thing to do in the world is draw blood and probably above phlebotomy is uh, arterial blood gases. That's my thing. I was, you know, certified vampire. I'm going to get, I can get blood out of the carpet. <laughs> I can. Anyway, so uh, I'm doing my thing, you know, I, AVGs and uh, these kinds of things. And, and we know it, uh, what, how we respond to angina. And the doctor takes his glove finger and puts a lube on his finger, reaches under the client, you know, under the covers and everything, and he puts his finger in the client's rectum. And he's push, 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 pushing right, and the client's in the bed doing his, oh, 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 right? And I'm looking going, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking to myself. And I asked him about it later, and he's like, well, when somebody's having a, you know, they think they're having a heart attack and they've got this chest pain, they're so focused on the chest pain, they're not really paying attention to you asking them, bear down like you're having a bowel movement. They're not actually doing it. So he's ensuring that they do that. And he's trying to perform a vagal maneuver. And while he's doing that, what? He could wind up potentially lowering their resting heart rate, right? Lowering their blood pressure, lowering their pulse, because what, what did we find out just a bit ago about the vagus nerve? If we stimulate it, right, a person's vitals could drop to the point that they pass out. Well, if you've got somebody having a heart attack because of their hypertension, right, stimulating the vagus nerve could be a great outcome potential. So, anyway, that's what's going on with that. Vagal maneuvers, when you hear that term, vagal maneuvers, that's what's going on. All right, great. Now, on to that spinal accessory. Now, we mentioned we have them shrug the shoulders against resistance, right? So we got our patient shrugging their shoulders. The other thing we like to do is have them turn their head to resistance as well as we're testing out their 11th cranial nerve or the spinal accessory nerve, or we said earlier what? The accessory nerve. And sometimes that word spinal's dropped off. Okay, great. That brings us to 12, hypoglossal. I've got my buddy in there, <laughs> right? All right, and for, for years, this has been my role model. Okay, so assessment. We're gonna have them stick out their tongue. And we want to have them press their tongue against their cheek while you're palpating. So you're palpating the patient's cheek and they're pressing their tongue against their cheek. And we're assessing the 12th cranial nerve. And the other thing to have them do is say hard consonants, right? So L, T, D, and N. Those hard consonants, they involve specific movements of the tongue and help with the assessment, right? So hypoglossal, and we remembered that this was not glossopharyngeal, why? G comes before H. So G was what number? Nine, and G kind of looks like a nine, a lowercase g, doesn't it? All right, yeah, okay, so, and then while we're at it, while we're, while we're doing this study smart strategy, we said the G kind of looks like the number nine, right? But then the Roman numeral 12 also kind of looks like, right? Do you see the H on the beginnings of it? for the Roman numeral, that is. Okay? Study smart, guys. And that's the end of part two. So you've got the cranial nerves. That was one through six that I did before. And this is part two, seven through 12. Hey, continue to study smart, guys. Thank you.